Well, hey, welcome back to our Bible study through the book of James. I want to thank John and Ben for their, uh, their studies these past couple times we've been together. I'm very thankful for the time and effort they've put into those. And if you haven't caught those, I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at those or look at any of our previous studies. Today, we are going to be in James chapter 5. Uh, we have one more, one more study after this. And we'll wrap up the book of James. James chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 1 through 6. So let's read through this passage, and then we will walk through this and look at what this, this part of James' letter is trying to instruct us in. Starting verse 1, it says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence, And you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Okay. Well, very clear we're going to be dealing with uh, the, the snare and the temptation of the pursuit of wealth and what wealth can do to us. Here in James' letter, he is writing, remember, to these Jewish believers, predominantly Jewish believers, and he is instructing them, instructing uh, very very likely some of them who are he's anticipating reading this or for those who they interact with in their culture, in their society, their towns, their, the areas. And he starts off speaking about a, these, this warning to them and in saying these, the, those who are rich, he says, you will weep and howl because these miseries are coming upon them. He's talking about the judgment of God that's coming upon them, that's going to be coming upon them. Their gold and their silver, it says, is corroded, and it will be evidenced against them, and will eat their flesh like fire. Uh, Very powerful words there that James is using. And he is making this clear that our passions, our pursuits, those things that we find great pleasure in, will either be those things that uh, vindicate our deeds, or they'll condemn us. Here he's talking about their wealth, these people, their wealth, their riches, their gold, their silver, and their garments. And so this would be something that is evidenced in their day, in their culture, by these, this fine clothing and garments. It would take great wealth to be able to have these garments, to wear this as a display of their wealth. And saying that this is going to be a testimony against you. These are the things that they pursue. These are the things that they sought after. They have accumulated. And they're going to be the very things that are going to bring testimony against them. These are going to be things that brought testimony against them. Um, And so the question that's going to be asking, were they generous with this? Were they wise stewards? Did they honor God with this wealth? Or is it the opposite? And for these, it's clearly the opposite. They were corrupt. They were greedy. They were corrupt. And they they stole and they withheld money from others. And he says, that which you desired will be the thing which bears testimony against you. The things that we pursue. And it might be wealth for someone, but it might be something else. It might be a position of authority. Is someone seeking a position of authority because they have a desire to serve? They have a desire to serve. And they want to, uh, to help others. They want to faithfully represent God and want to ensure that God is honored in those positions. Or is it they want, to, they want to govern over people and they want people to do, to do their bidding and they want people to satisfy their own desires. Is that why they're pursuing these positions of authority? Well, that position itself will bear testimony against them. It will either vindicate or condemn. And there may be someone who, who seeks fame or, or other things. That very thing will be the thing that will vindicate or condemn the deeds. It's the heart of the matter of that thing. 
or whatever that pursuit was, whatever that possession, that thing was, it will vindicate us or it will condemn us. But it's based on our heart and what we did with that thing. And so this is how he's starting off with them and speaking to them. And then he, he goes on and continues. He says, you have these treasures laid up, these treasures laid up. And so he, he's bringing this judgment against these rich people that he's addressing and saying, you have accumulated great wealth and laid it aside, these treasures, but yet you didn't even pay those who labored for you. He says, behold, the wages of the laborers, verse 4, who mowed your fields, you kept back by fraud, by fraud. And so these people, because of their greed, because they know, knowing that they would be able to get away with injustice and fraud, they accumulated more of their wealth. They withheld it. They kept it to themselves. And God says, that wealth which you treasured so much and you held on to so much is going to be the thing that's going to be your judgment against you. It's going to be the thing that rises up and condemns you. The thing that you treasured, you cherished, you wanted so bad will be the very thing that condemns you before God. And he says, and in this situation, these laborers, these people who worked for you, who, who did things that benefited you and promoted you, you did not give them what was due to them. You withheld it. And God is not going to withhold the judgment because these are people speaking to people here who are not repentant, not seeking repentance. And this is a general truth that I think is very, very important to us and understand that when we stand before God, uh, nothing of our earthly uh, abilities or things that we accumulated will be something that will impress God enough for Him to permit us to enter into the kingdom. Uh, God is holy and He is righteous and He is pure, and only those who have been purified can enter into the kingdom. And our wealth does not purify us. One's wealth does not purify them, and so God is not impressed by that. God is not impressed, listen to this, God is not impressed by the beauty of the beautiful. In our world, especially in our culture here in America, beauty, uh, physical beauty, is cherished above many, it's right up there with wealth, is one of the things, the primary things. And, and people become famous and become adored because of their physical beauty. And people utilize sometimes that physical beauty in ways that are not God-honoring, that are godless, that actually cause, well, in some situations, they use it to bring about a, a lustful reaction in people, which in, in turn creates a, a position of those, for those people in our culture. But God is not impressed by the beauty of the beautiful. God has made our world beautiful. He has made things beautiful. There are, he has made us all and created us. But He is the one who's given it. And He is not going to bow to something or someone because of its physical beauty. He is one, God wants us to be purified. He wants us, we have to be purified to be able to be for Him. The only way for that to happen is not because I go out and I perform a lot of good deeds and hoping that my good deeds will do that. Uh, good deeds are honorable. They're what we're supposed to be doing. You can refer back and look to what James says about our deeds, but we are not justified in only in those deeds. It must be that those deeds are motivated out of our faith in Jesus Christ, and they are because of the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit who has brought us life, that has caused us to be born again, and therefore since we are born again, we're bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, these deeds, good deeds. But my good deeds do not expunge my sinful deeds of the past. Uh, those sinful deeds have to be taken care of by something else, and that is only taken care of by Jesus Christ Himself. He's the only one who can purify us of those and to justify us and to present us before the Father as holy and as pure. Now, uh, back to this specific thing that, uh, that James is addressing, the specific issue of wealth. 
The Bible talks a lot about wealth. It addresses it a lot. Jesus spoke a lot about wealth. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, uh, verses 6 through 10, it says this, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Paul is writing this letter to Timothy and urging him as he is, Timothy is going to be instructing um, Paul is instructing Timothy, and Timothy is to be instructing others of this, of the lure and that the wealth has, that riches have, and how it can ensnare us. And he says here that it is a root of all manner of evils. Now, in, uh, I believe it's the King James Version, and some other versions they'll say, uh, money is the root of all evil. But a better understanding is that what it is getting at, what this passage is meaning, is that, that the love of money is a root of all manner of evils. There's all manner of evils, greed and covetousness, envy, lust, pride. All of these things can be manifested and could be stemming from a, a love and a pursuit of riches. And so all manners, manner of evils, plural, evils, come from a love of money. Um, and, and so he is warning, he is warning this because there are some, even this was a this is a sad thing. He talks about there are some who who abandon, and, and there are some who are who are wandering away from the faith because of this pursuit of wealth. And that was true in the day of the Apostle Paul at the early church just being established. And it's it's the truth today. We see this today. In Mark chapter 10, we see another instance where Jesus is addressing a young man who has great wealth. And we, and if you recall this story, this young man comes to Jesus and he says, What must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus asks him, What about the commands? And he lists several of the commands, some of the Ten Commandments and the law. And, he, and the young man says, Well, hey, I have kept those from my youth. I've kept those from my youth. Now, he's uh, obviously this young man, he's a little naive and unknowingly boastful in his, his righteousness because there's no way he has perfectly kept them. But he is acknowledging to whatever degree, we're not going to, that's not necessary to really look into those because Jesus reveals to this young man what is truly keeping him from the kingdom the thing that is truly keeping him from it. Because that was the question he asked, what must I do? What do I need to do to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus is telling him, eventually tells him, well, I'm, I'm going to reveal to you that which is keeping you from it. That which is keeping you from it. This is an important thing to note too. We've been reading about the rich and James is talking about the rich and it's, it was, his address is a very negative uh, approach, but he, understand he is addressing certain specific people and the pursuit of wealth are the things he's addressing. Because Jesus here, if you read in Mark, and you read in Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 31, read that account of this rich young man. It says that Jesus loved this man. Jesus looked at this man compassionately. He was not indignant. He was not upset and frustrated about this young man or towards his wealth, but he loved him. And he had compassion upon him. And that's why motivated Jesus sharing with him, this is the one thing that's going to keep you from the kingdom. It is your love of money. And he tells him that in this way. He says, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. His ultimate one thing he was lacking was that he was not willing to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. He, there was something in the way. He was his money, because it says then this young man left, and he was greatly saddened and grieved by this. Because why? Because he had a he had a multitude of possessions, and he had to leave uh, just 
frustrated at this. Now, Jesus then talks to his disciples and he teaches his disciples and he just tells them that um, it is exceedingly difficult for the wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples are astounded by this. As a matter of fact, then Jesus says, well, you know what, actually it's impossible for man. But with God, it is possible. Remembering this, Jesus called to himself some wealthy people, people with, with, uh, with means, even people who had, who had uh, gathered those means in corrupt ways. <laughs> the tax collectors, you think of Matthew, who becomes one of the 12. Um, you think of Zacchaeus and other tax collectors. Jesus brought the gospel to them, the message to them, and called some of them to himself. So he, it wasn't just a, I'm not even going to talk to them. I'm, they're just corrupt to the core, and there's no way that these people could ever, ever turn from their sin. But he has compassion upon them, reveals to them their greed. Some of them repent, and many do not. Now, one last thing I want to bring up as we kind of bring this to a conclusion and wrap this up. One last truth about the love of money. Um, one does not have to be rich to be ensnared in the love of money. Um, there are many people who are of very meager or modest means who are ensnared and enslaved to the pursuit of wealth. It's not just a rich man's problem. It sometimes is more obvious there, uh, but there are people who have wealth who serve the Lord and love the Lord and want to use that wealth to honor Him and be a blessing to other people. And there are also a multitude of those of modest or meager means who are ensnared by the pursuit of wealth. And they believe that money is the answer they're seeking after. It's, they believe that money is what they need. Um, what we need to do is to seek after the things of God and, may mo- and, and not allow money to ensnare us and, may, and not allow it to be the thing that we're pursuing after, that we wouldn't be plagued by it. We live in a culture where we are abundantly blessed individually, and we should be thankful for that. As, as we are seeking honest, we are making honest wages and and seeking to honor God with that, we should should be thankful for that. Uh, But always remembering that we need to be seeking the kingdom first, pursuing those things that honor Him, pursuing that righteousness and pursuing after Christ to honor Him, and not allowing wealth, uh, which is one of the great gods of our culture, to ensnare us and grip us, and that would be the thing we pursue. Well, hey, um, let let me close this out in just a word of prayer. And then we will wrap up our moment. Father God, I want to thank you so much for your word and the challenge it is to us. That, and I pray you'd speak to our hearts. It's so easy for me to think of this person or that person and how, how they are just ensnared by wealth. But God, when I just pray you ask, I ask that you would reveal to us individually if, if there are ways that we are actually seeking after wealth that are and pursuing it, that it's got a grip on us. If we are so... Um, if we are pursuing like the lottery over and over and over because we are motivated out of a, a, a love of wealth and money and riches, God, correct us of that. Help us to follow after you and to honor you and to be thankful for what you have given us. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.